right. Are you ready? Okay. Here we are talking about decoding the book of Revelation from a Jewish perspective. But I want to begin with peace to prosperity, which is uh, basically the name of this peace plan. What I think is fascinating is we are in the year 2020. And when you think of 2020, what do you think of? This is called, literally, this is what this is called, a vision for peace between the state of Israel, the Palestinians, and the region. Now, how many of you have the 180-page document? How many of you know you can get it for, as a free download? You can get it. It's easy to get. I, not sure if it's attached on our website yet, but I, I know we have it. If, if you, we can, I can email it to you, whoever. It's easy to get. Just put down Peace to Prosperity document on the Internet, and you can download the whole document for free. It's all over the place. So if you want to take the time and detail read what this agreement is, you can do that. Now, I've received several emails. Pastor Mark, what do you think of this agreement? And uh, one of the first things that I want to know is, what does Jeremy Compel think of this agreement? What does David Rubin think of these agreements? What are the, you know, that's who I want to see. What's their thoughts? And so over this last week, I kind of researched it to see, okay, where is this at? So I have some PowerPoints I'm going to show you, and I'm going to, I have, uh, sorry, the people that are signing. I have several pages here that I didn't advance to you. I'll try to talk slow, but not too slow. All right, so let me explain to you, for those that haven't had a chance to look at this agreement, what I have here uh, is comments from several different people that are pro-Torah, pro-Israel, not dividing the land. Okay, so that's who I'm, I'm reading from. And uh, such as maybe Jeremy Gappel or David Rubin or other places uh, and other rabbis that don't want to divide the land. How many of you know you don't want to divide the land? Okay. Well, here's what's fascinating. One of the things they said concerning a Palestinian state is that the plan does not include an immediate recognition of a Palestinian state. What it does, it expects a willingness on Israel's part to create a pathway toward a Palestinian statehood, but it is based on their behavior. Aha. Uh -huh. A Palestinian state will only come into existence in four years if the Palestinians accept the plan, if they stop paying terrorists, if Hamas and Islamic Jihad put down their weapons. In addition, the American plan calls on the Palestinians to give up corruption, <laughs> respect human rights, freedom of religion, Freedom of the press. They have to recognize Israel as a Jewish state with its capital in Jerusalem. They have to stop paying terrorists, eliminate hateful indoctrination and incitement in their schools, and so on. <clears throat> this is why a boss came out and said a thousand times, no, 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 no. They already knew they were going to say no. But this gives Israel the go-ahead to annex more land. Okay, that's the key. Only if these conditions are met, then the U.S. will recognize a Palestinian state and implement also a massive economic plan to assist. But Trump's deal does not require Israel to recognize Arab sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. Okay, they just get to have like a little municipal government. Such recognition will only be required if the leaders of the Arabs accept all the conditions of the deal. Now, how many of you know all the Arabs met today? And guess what? They all rejected the plan, aghast. 
the demand that the Palestinians take significant steps to demonstrate their peaceful intentions prior to receiving any concessions is the key change in this approach. And how many of you know the Palestinians have rejected a state in 1947, in 1967, in 1993, in 2000, in 2008, okay? I used to be upset that Netanyahu always says he's for a two-state solution. But then I come to realize that's to appease the Europeans and all the other people because he knows it'll never happen. But, but here's the thing, too. I don't know if you knew this, but for decades, our State Department has refused to declare that Jerusalem was even in Israel. This is the deep state. This is our own State Department. They refuse to. Re That's why they, if, if an American Jew went over to Israel and their child was born in Jerusalem, they will not allow their passports to say Jerusalem, Israel. But this is our own State Department. So this is, the, with Trump, everything changed. Um, the United States, the United States was opposed to all Jewish settlements in Judea, Samaria, Gaza. Israel needed to get a building permit to build a porch on a house in their own country if it was in the West Bank from the United States. They had to get building permits from us until President Trump. Israel has always, this is the problem, Israel has always been too concerned with public opinion. They've always stopped short of annexing the territory that they've won. In 48, in 67, 73, whatever, Israel would win this territory, but they say, oh, but it's not ours. We're not going to annex it. That's been the problem. Now, here's the thing. The world court may take action if Israel begins to annex Jewish towns in Judea and Samaria. The international community backs this view and overwhelmingly considers the settlements to be illegal that they're building. In. This has been the, the problem. So Israel appears to be not caring, barreling toward a showdown with the international community over Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria, with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court poised to launch a war crimes probe of Israel's settlement policies. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced Tuesday that he plans to move ahead with the potentially explosive annexation of large parts of Judea and Samaria, including dozens of Jewish settlements. He's going to annex them. Now, the, the problem is uh, Pompeo and Kushner kind of disagrees a little bit, even though they're on the same team. The whole thing is some of them want the annexation of all the territory right now. Let's just get it done. Others say, well, let's take our time doing the annexing so we don't disrupt the, the Arabs. And so that's a big debate in Israel right now. And Kushner has told Netanyahu, don't do any annexation until after your own elections next month. Okay? Netanyahu may say, well, politically, this is good for me. I'm going to annex everything this Sunday. So tomorrow, we're going to find out from the political side, if they're going to annex everything tomorrow and declare it is true, or if they're going to wait after the elections. That is yet to be seen. Last month, the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court declared there is a reasonable basis to believe that settlement construction constitutes a war crime. So if they add even a house, I mean, this is the problem Israel is having, even with the United States saying, don't you build, don't you build. And so there's all these little things kind of going on. Okay, now, an expert on international law at the Israel Democracy Institute said that go ahead and annexing everything would significantly raise the risk of triggering prosecution at the ICC. Well, these settlements are widely viewed as illegal based on the Geneva Convention principle that an occupying power is barred from transferring its population into war-torn territories. But they're not occupying, it's their land. Now, Israel does not accept the court's authority anyway. But Netanyahu appears to be taking the threat of prosecution seriously because he could get arrested if he goes to France or if he goes somewhere else. So even though Israel as a nation can protect 
the prime minister, if they annex everything and they plan to travel to another country, they could get arrested. So this is something that they have to consider. Uh, so while the court would have a hard time prosecuting Israelis, it could issue arrest warrants that would make it difficult for Israeli officials to travel abroad. But the major turning point for Israel was this last November when the U.S. declared that it did not consider these settlements to be illegal. That's a good thing. Just like all of a sudden they say the embassy could be in Jerusalem. The Golan Heights is not occupied territory. Okay. Now, um, the landmark decision appears to have played a key role in Netanyahu's announcement that he plans to annex the Jordan Valley and Israel's more than 100 settlements they have all throughout the area. This last Tuesday, Trump said this. Israel is a light to the nations. The land of Israel is the promised land and the historic homeland of the Jewish people. Now, I don't know how many of you know the politics in Israel and who the players are, but the defense minister, Naftali Bennett, uh, he's, a, he's one of the main patrons of all the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. He said that Tomorrow, Netanyahu should immediately annex all of Israel's settlements and snuff out any hopes for a Palestinian independence. Let's get it done. Now, I talked to uh, Jeremy Gimpel a little bit, and he says this. He says, concerning this agreement, even though it was highly unlikely, but if the Palestinians did agree, it would have been a disaster. Okay, so th this thing is horrible. I mean, this one thing, it's, it's absolutely horrible if the Palestinians agree. But the good thing is we know they're not going to agree. Okay, but here's the thing. Here's what this other uh, rabbi said. He said, the bad thing on this plan is this. First off, recognition of a Palestinian state is a bone in the throat of every Torah Jew as the potential loss of sovereignty over parts of the heartland of the Jewish people that God granted to us for eternity. But, and he even said this, as one rabbi said, no generation has the right to compromise the boundaries of the land of Israel that were given to us by the Creator and delineated in the Torah. That land is the possession of the Jewish people for all time, and there's no single individual, group, or generation that has the moral, halakhic, or legal right to waive that possession. And yeah, so then he says, so why then is this plan not an unmitigated disaster, as has been almost every other American or Israeli police plan going back to 1969. He says, this time it's because the onus is on the Arabs to accept the plan. As the basis for negotiations, even as it makes absolutely no reference, it also makes no reference to a return of refugees or compensation for loss of homes, and it even implicitly rejects both. As far as Palestinian refugees goes, this plan says they're welcome in the Palestinian state. And he says this, nevertheless, the plan is not without risks that must be addressed. The main problem is that Israeli acceptance of the plan can be misinterpreted as an acceptance and principle of a future Palestinian state. It is true the plan foresees the Palestinian state, but only after this list of conditions are fulfilled and they're unlikely to ever be fulfilled. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a video. Jill, let's play this little video now at this point. This is what Hamas video did in regard <laughs> So guess what? The Jews are rejoicing they didn't accept the plan. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's, here's what they say. Um, <laughs> I lost my place. Okay. <laughs> Nevertheless, 
such conditional and limited recognition could potentially take on a dynamic where it could be forgotten and swept under the rug by a future American president. That is the scary part. It is therefore crucial that these conditions and limitations be firmly locked in. Israel is agreeing to this plan only because of its trust in this particular American administration. If it is found that no progress has been made, Israel will, in coordination with the current administration, extend its sovereignty to further areas of Judea and Samaria that are required for its long-term security. Nevertheless, he said, despite all good intentions, it could play out poorly under future administrations, leading inadvertently to a hostile Palestinian state on Israel's doorstep. Now, here's the, th here's the, the map. For those of you that haven't seen the, the map, now, I'm going to bring it in. Let me just bring it up here a second. Uh, here is a list of some of the settlements. But here, let me go a little bit. Let me just bring this in real close. Okay, how's that? Number four, five, and six. You see these little, you see, well, let me get rid of that. You see these little brown roads? Everything that's green is the future Palestinian state. Everything that's green is supposed to be a Palestinian state. All these dark blue roads are Palestinian roads in the Palestinian state. All the number of things are little Jewish settlements in the middle of that Palestinian state. And these little brown roads are the Jewish roads to get the heck out of there. How they can get to the brown area, which is all Israel. That's what these roads are. Number three is Elon Moreh. That's where Abraham built the very first altar when he entered the promised land. Number four is Itamar, for those who went to, who know where Itamar is. Number five is um, Habraka, Mount Gerizim, where the blessing is. This is where, you know, Shechem is and the, where Joseph is buried. But all of those areas, if, it, if this event happens and this plan happens, these Jewish settlements get to stay. They're now legitimate. They're not considered illegal. But the problem is they're surrounded with little exit roads to get out. Uh, number eight down here toward the bottom is where Jeremy Gampel is, Malay Amos. And for those that want to go on the trip this Israel, we're going to spend a day with Jeremy Gampel at, at his place. So that's one of the things. Okay, but anyway, I just kind of wanted you to see what we had here, trying to explain it to give you a better idea. Okay, so that's, but that also is actually going to give land along the Egyptian border uh, all in place of the West Bank settlements that they're taking out of their area. Okay, so now on my notes here, I have the Palestinians will have a capital in East Jerusalem, and they say, we're not dividing Jerusalem. There's already a gigantic barrier between them that's been around for a long time. It's divided. We're just saying that's West Jerusalem, that's East Jerusalem, it's all Jerusalem, we're not dividing it. But Abu Dis is, let me bring this up, right here, you can see the word Abu Dis. This is, here's the Temple Mount, see the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock? Here's the Mount of Olives. You can see all the cemetery thing there. Over here is Bethphage. Going down the hill is Bethany where Lazarus lives, uh, lived. And uh, he did rise from the dead. You know. uh, but anyway, right here, this, this area in here is where the Palestinian capital is going to be. But the scary thing is the Mount of Olives. That's a dividing line. You know, or the, uh, so anyway, that's kind of uh, scary how the close it is going to be. But see, they, they already have, this is one of the walls of Jerusalem, a barrier between East and West Jerusalem. So it's, Jerusalem has been divided for a long time by this wall. Okay, so, but anyway, uh, settlements, it says... Uh, Israel, as far as the settlements goes, Israel will retain the Jordan Valley. All the settlements in the West Bank, uh, in the broadest definition possible, meaning not just the municipal borders of each settlement, but the, a security perimeter as well. 
and it includes 15 different isolated settlements. The IDF gets to have access uh, to these settlements, uh, and the, the Palestinian state gets no right to any of the air above it. Israel, ha they can't have an army. They, I mean, it's, uh, Israel controls their, the border. Israel controls the air above it. Um, Israel will have to take action to apply sovereignty to their own settlements, uh, which, again, like I said, he plans on doing tomorrow. Uh, Israel is going to be in control of security from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the IDF does not have to leave the West Bank. And let's see. But now here's something else. This is from Breaking Israel News. They look at things from more of a biblical prophetic term. Rabbi Yosef Berger, he's the rabbi of King David's tomb on Mount Zion. He explained it this way. Like Cyrus, Trump's connection to the Messiah is that he will play a role in one of the major functions of the Messiah. He will pave the way for the building of the third temple. Now, those of you that get our calendar know, I really believe this year is going to be gear. By the end of this year, there won't be a temple, but I believe their announcement will come about that, hey, we need to have the temple built. There's another gentleman. Uh, his name is Dr. Minns. And he told Breaking Israel News that just as the declaration of Cyrus was accepted by just a part of Israel, but it was the catalyst for the Jews to build the second temple, Israel today should take Trump's deal as the ticket that opens for a greater future for the nation of Israel. Uh, he says Cyrus didn't take upon himself to act for the Jewish people. He did not build the temple. He didn't reinstate the Davidic dynasty. He merely motivated the Jews to act independently. And that is precisely what Trump is doing. He's not giving Israel a gift. He's not forcing something upon us. He's just telling us to do what is only our right and obligation to do in our own country. Um, so now I want to go to the Bible for a second here. Now, I, I'm going to give you some Bible verses that aren't on your notes here, several. If you just want to write them down, you can look it up. Which I think is just fascinating. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 10 I'm going to give you verses you've all memorized anyway. You all know. In Jeremiah 29, 10, is the Lord says, After 70 years are accomplished in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good words toward you and causing you to return to this place. Okay? Uh, how many of you know history repeats itself? Okay, that's what the Bible says. Okay? Uh, over and over. That which has happened is that which will happen again. Well, I think it's interesting that now, after 70 years of Israel becoming a nation, the Lord is going to be performing his good word toward Israel again. Now, Daniel 9.24 talks about 70 weeks are decreed upon the Jews and their holy city. And it's to finish the transgression, put an end to sin, atone for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, you know, that hasn't happened yet. Okay, now... We know that these are 70 weeks of years, so everyone knows that is 70 times 7, which is 490 years. So there was 490 years. The very next verse says this, Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to Messiah the Prince will be 69 weeks. Okay, 7 weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks. That's one week short of 70, right? Now, if 490 minus 7 puts you at 483 years, right? Okay, and, and it talks about, in Daniel 9, look at verse 25 and 26, it says, Go and understand, okay, from the going forth of commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to the Messiah is going to be 69 weeks. The street will be built, the wall, and the wall. How many of you have been to the wall? You know what I'm talking about. The wall will be built again. Then it says, but after the 62 weeks, you, you have seven weeks, then you have 62 weeks, and then Messiah is cut off at the end of the 69th week. And then it says, the people of the prince will come and destroy the city, which you know happened in 70 AD and the sanctuary. Okay. Now, how many of you know the temple was destroyed in 586, 587, right? How many know Jeremiah is around Ezekiel's around, Daniel's around. Okay, now look at Ezra. First off, there were like three different decrees to build Jerusalem and the temple. 
which decree are we talking about? I'm going to give you the three decrees. The first decree was in Ezra 1, 1 through 3. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So this is talking about the one we just got done reading after 70 years in Jeremiah. The Ezra 1 is the fulfillment of the Jeremiah prophecy with Cyrus. And the Lord stirs up the spirit of Cyrus so that he may made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and put it in writing. Now, <clears throat> this is Cyrus the Persian. Okay, this decree was made about 537 B.C. Okay, 580, you know, 7, the temple was destroyed. The captivity had already happened a little bit earlier. So now it's Ezra, in Ezra 1, 1 through 3, this is happening about 537. But I want you to notice it said the word of the Lord by the prophet of Jeremiah, not the prophet of Daniel. So you're, we're not going to base it on this decree. Now, <clears throat> let's look at uh, Ezra 6. The first one, one I just read was Ezra 1, 1 through 3. Now we're going to jump to Ezra 6, 1 through 3. Now, instead of Cyrus, we have a man by the name of Darius. Cyrus is a Persian. Darius is a Mede. Then Darius, the king, made a decree. Search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll where it was written by Cyrus, referring to his decree, uh, it says, the same Cyrus, the king, who made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem that let the house be built and the place where they offered and let the foundation be strongly laid. This is 518 BC. All right. This is a, you can look this up on the internet. I'm giving you the, the proper dates. Now we go to the next chapter, Ezra 7 verse 1. Now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, kings of Persia, it's no longer Medes, we got the Persians, we find in verse 7 through 10, Ezra 7, 7 through 10, there went up some of the children of Israel and the priests and the Levites and the singers and the porters to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month. What month is the fifth month? Av. What month was Jerusalem destroyed? On the ninth of Av. So the very time it was destroyed, we now have this happening. And it says it was on the first day of the first month. That's Nisan 1. Okay. That uh, he went up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month, he arrived in Jerusalem. According to the good hand of his God for Ezra. I think this is the key. And that's why I'm using this date. Because now they're finally saying, okay, let's get it done. It says, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the Torah of the Lord, to do it and to teach Israel statutes and judgments. Artaxerxes reigned from 465 to 424 B.C., and they believe the seventh year is, uh, let me see, if, make sure I got this right. There was, yeah, uh, the seventh year is 457 B.C., okay? 458. I mean, you take 465 that he reigned from and subtract seven years, you're going to get 457, 458. But now, here we go to Ezra 7, verse 12 and 13. Look what happens. Artaxerxes, the king of kings, unto, said unto uh, Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace at such a time, he says, I make a decree. So here's this other decree that all of those of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will, go up to Jerusalem and go with you. Okay. So this is 457 BC. Now I believe that this is the key decree because now they're, they're all unified. They've got the law. They want to seek the Torah well, if that's 450 B.C., if you use that as the date for the 483 years to Messiah the Prince, you take 457 and go 143 years, that gets you to 26, 27 A.D. when Messiah was here, began his ministry for three years. 
So I think it's very fascinating that this date fulfills that prophecy of Daniel to Messiah the Prince. Now we know there were 490 years were determined, right? If 490 years are determined, totally, there's one week left. 483 years had gone by, right? And patterns repeat. So we look for a repeat in the pattern, okay? How many of you have ever heard of Sultan Suleiman? Who has not heard of Sultan Suleiman? Who has no idea what I'm talking about? That should be most of the hands. Okay, let me explain. There was the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Sultan Suleiman the first, known as Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. He was the greatest sultan of the Ottoman Empire's many centuries. What had happened, Jerusalem had come under Ottoman control in the year 1517. Now, I don't know if they date 1517 rings a bell, but a few months earlier or years earlier is 1492. Okay, Columbus selling the ocean blue. You also have Martin Luther. Okay, we're talking about the Reformation. During the time of the Reformation, it's Martin Luther. I mean, this is what's going on. Sultan Suleiman, okay, the, he took over Jerusalem in the year 1517. But get a load of this. Solomon's efforts in Jerusalem. Now, do you remember the Crusades? That's the Christian Crusades coming in and destroying Jerusalem and taking over and kicking the Jews out and all this kind of thing. Sultan Suleiman, his efforts in Jerusalem included extensive renovation. He was known as a builder. He's the one who renovated the Dome of the Rock. And he did an upgrade to all of the city's infrastructure that remains to this day. The walls that you see around the old city of Jerusalem is his walls. When you go to Jerusalem and you see all the old city walls, they are not the original walls. These are walls that this guy built, Sultan Suleiman. Okay? Now, um, after weathering waves of successive conquerors before that, Jerusalem's walls had fallen into disrepair, and by the time of the Ottomans' arrival, the city was barely fortified. So Suleiman commissioned the city wall overhaul in 1536 to protect Jerusalem's inhabitants from a feared crusader invasion by Christians as the memory of success and successive Christian assaults on the Holy Land was still fresh in the mind of the Muslim uh, majority. But guess, get a load of this. Solomon possessed a remarkable religious tolerance for his time. He also stressed the inclusion of the holy sites of all of Jerusalem face within the city plan. Christians could worship on the temple. Muslims could worship on the temple. Jews could worship on the temple. This was the, the Islamic sultan. Okay. Matter of fact, get a load of this. When he had learned that one of his architects had left Mount Zion holy to the city's Jews and Christians, outside the confines of the new wall that he had built, he had them executed. He said, you're going to include the Jews and the Christians. Okay. Now, so here we have the rebuilding of the walls in 1536. You add 490 years, that takes you to 2026. You subtract seven years, that puts you right at 2019, 2020. And is there a connection to this Solomon the Great? Well, I think it's interesting. Trump authorized Soleimani's killing seven months ago with conditions. Right at 2019, here you have the connection of Solomon the Great, and here you have Soleimani being killed and a new era beginning. Okay, anyway. Anyway. 